I'm continuing the Naked series, which this will probably be the last one. The first sermon was Naked at the Wedding. The second one was um, Naked Before the Divine Council. And then the third one today will be Naked or Clothed Before the Supreme Court. And um, from the first two sermons, what did we determine? There are two people, two classes of people. In the wedding feast, you have one class, a man who brought what he felt was probably adequate. But what did he have to do? He had to take it off. He had to unclothe himself so that he could put something else on to be acceptable before the king in the wedding feast. In the second, the second topic, we had another man, Joshua the high priest. He was clothed as well. What was he dressed in? He was dressed in filthy rags. And we went through, through what filth was and what that word translated to, and it was really feces, poop, pee. That's what he was covered in. Rags stained with human excrement. That is the condition that we all bear as we present ourselves to God, even if we are the high priest. But yet God still found a way to accept him. And what did he have to do? What it had to happen for him in order that he may be clothed in the white raiment? He had to be disrobed. He had to be unclothed. Probably had to be cleaned. And then he had to keep that ra new raiment pure, correct? So those are two examples in the Bible. Now, you and me, how will we be on our judgment day? Will we be clothed? Will we be clothed in our own righteousness, our own human excrement? Would it be better if we're unclothed? Maybe, because then we can be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. And we reviewed twice in the last sermon. I won't read the, 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 the quote again today. But Ellen White states that ever since the fall of man, humankind has been weaving clothes to try to cover up their sinful state. But all of our righteousness, another verse, both, both uh, previous sermons, all of our righteousness is really as filthy rags. So our key text today, Daniel 7.10, um, which Brother John read for us, a stream of fire issued and came out from before him. Ten thousands and thousands served him, and ten times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were open. Now, I can't help but think of current events. What is a famous trial going on right now? There's got to be somebody who knows about this trial. Johnny Depp and, and uh, Miss Heard. And it's a defamation trial. And I am just fascinated by this trial. It's amazing. When I looked at this trial, I realized this trial is an introspection of kind of what we are going to be going through in our judgment. And how, how can I say something like this? First of all, it's famous. This is a famous case. It's become very public. I can't go on YouTube without all these little clips popping up. This thing, that thing. You don't know about the Amy Heard, Johnny Depp trial? Well, they're, they are movie stars. They uh, were married for maybe a year or two. Um, and they became divorced. And Johnny Depp is suing Miss Heard, his ex-wife, because she defamed him by saying that he was an abusive husband. If you want to know more, the internet will inform you. I will not go any further. But all those who like to follow movie stars and wealthy people, they will focus in on this, and they will, they're, they're watching the whole trial live on YouTube. So as I looked at this, I realized that famous people are much like good reformers. They like to look good. Go look at them. Johnny Depp is in his fancy, fancy glasses, his good, expensive suit. Uh, Miss Heard is in her fancy business suit with a very somber look on her face, but she looks good. And you think of movie stars and wealthy people, they like to give money to the poor. They think they're going to save the planet. You know, if you look at them superficially, they're pretty okay looking, right? A good reformer in their own way. They're good role models, they think. Why, I even think of Angelina Jolie, another famous lady, 
She was just in Ukraine with the United Nations just a few weeks ago. She was caught in Ukraine. You know, she had to make an appearance. Doesn't she look so good? She's such a good, wealthy person. But then you have something like this happen, the defamation trial. And you know what is unique about this defamation trial? You have people who were married suing each other. And what happens when your spouse sues you? They know everything about you. You know everything about them. And all the dirty laundry comes out. Everything. And that's what you're seeing here. So you have two individuals who look good, but now they're just spilling each other's dirty laundry out. And in the end, you look at these two individuals, and they really don't look that good. The glasses are not that great. You realize that they're really just miserable human beings. And I encourage you to look into it a little bit. It's amazing the stuff that comes out. How much more will it be for us? When it's not just our spouse, our ex-spouse accusing us, but every thought, every imagination, every intention of the soul goes out on live TV in the heavenly realm. You know, we are a famous case. Each and every one of us will be a famous case. Uh, in fact, we will talk about it today. We are on trial. How are we being portrayed before the media of heaven? before the ultimate judge, the, the ultimate Supreme Court. You know, I, I look at these people, they drive in in their nice cars, they're Escalade, they come out, they're escorted, but you know what, in the end, they're just standing in their feces, in their filthy rags. And it's not just them, you know, you look at them and, and you can easily say, you know, these people are so dysfunctional. You know, I can't know who's right or wrong because when you look at it, they're just the most dysfunctional ex-couple in the world. But you know what, we are no different. And in the eyes of God, there is no difference between them and us. So with that segue, I know we're all very righteous people and we don't keep up on pop culture. With that segue, we'll go into um, the great controversy. Now before I go in, I want to say the idea of these three sermons I actually got from a sermon preached back in 1987. How old was I in 1987? I was around one year old, maybe even less, if I was born in December of 86. This was preached by my grandfather. He called it the investigative judgment, and he recommended three things. He recommended you read Joshua and the High Priest from Testimony 6, Volume 6. That was my second sermon. He recommended that you read the chapter um, from Christ's Object Lessons on, um, on the wedding feast. And then he also recommended you read Great Controversy, um, Great Controversy entitled The Investigative Judgment. That was chapter 28. That's an older version of the Great Controversy. He said, read those three chapters and you will have a deeper understanding of the investigative judgment of the time we're living in. So, I mean, I can't give you an exhaustive understanding of this. You're just going to have to read it yourself. But hopefully with these three sermons, we can get a better understanding of the gravity of the times that we are living in today. Because we are all in our own defamation, our own defamation trial. Um, Great Controversy, page 485. Opposite each name in the books of heaven is entered with terrible exactness every word, every selfish act, every unfilled duty, every sin, every artful dissembling. Heaven sent warnings or reproofs neglected, wasted moments. How many of us can waste moments, huh? You may not be act actively sinning, but you've wasted time, moments, not even hours, moments. Unimproved opportunities, influences exerted for good or evil with its far-reaching results, all are chronicled by the recording angel. Uh, page 485, another quote. The angels of God witness each sin and registered in, uh, it in the unerring records. Sins may be concealed, denied, covered up from father, mother, wife, children, and associates, but no, uh, no one but the guilty actors may cherish the least suspicion of the wrong. But it is laid bare before the intelligences of heaven. The darkest night the secrecy of all deceptive arts, it is not sufficient to veil one thought 
from the knowledge of the eternal. God has an exact record of every unjust account and every unfair dealing. That's scary. That is a lot more scary about an abusive relationship where there's only two years of knowledge, intimate knowledge of a couple. This is more than intimate. This is the thoughts and the intents of the heart for our whole life. Everything written out in perfection and everything to be displayed before the heavenly intelligences. So my question for us is, are we prepared for this hour? Are we prepared for our destiny? Just as we, just as some people are obsessed with this trial here on earth, so is heaven, Ellen White says in page 43, the deepest interest manifested among men in the earthly decisions, uh, in the decisions of earthly tribunals is but faintly represented in the interest evinced by the heavenly courts when the names entered in the book of life come up in review before the judge of all the earth. Could the veil that separates the visible from the invisible world be swept back? The children of men would behold an angel recording every word and deed, which they must meet again in the judgment. How many words are uttered daily that would remain unspoken? How many deeds would remain undone? Very scary very scary time to be living if we do believe we are living in the end times. Open your Bibles with me to uh, Daniel 7, and we'll start in verse 9. Daniel 7, verses 9. I primarily will be reading from the English Standard Version today with some King James. Verse 9. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as wool, his hair was like a head, like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. Thousands, thousands served him, and ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were open. And page 479 of the great controversy, Ellen White says that this prophecy here in Daniel took place at the termination of the 2300 days and that time happened in 1884. So this prophecy of the judgment being set began or foretold the judgment starting in 1844. Now I'm not going to go into uh, dates, times, numbers. This is something that's very, very familiar to the Adventist. To the average Adventist, everybody knows 2300 days, they know 1844, then they know the judgment is beginning in 1844, and if we need, if people don't understand this, maybe we can go through some of those prophecies again at another time. But we generally accept that the end times are here, and the judgment began in 1844. So who is being judged? Who is being judged? Sister Maria says she's pointing at me. She says herself. Am I being judged? Are we all in this room being judged? To better understand the investigative judgment or the final judgment that's beginning in 1844, we need to look back to an ancient... Day of Atonement, uh, back when the Israelites were in uh, the wilderness traveling from Egypt to their new land, to Canaan. So every year there was uh, a sanctuary service set up called the Day of Atonement. But the Day of Atonement was one day out of all the other days in the year. What would happen if somebody sinned on another day? Let's say I sinned. I realized I sinned, I would go take my sin offering to the sanctuary. This was the daily sacrifices. These were the sin offerings, okay? I would go and I would take my offering to the sanctuary. I would lay my hands on the offering and I would confess my sins onto the lamb. Then what would happen to the lamb? The lamb would be slain. 
Then the priest would go and he would take the blood of the lamb and he would sprinkle it in various places. But one place he would go is he would go and sprinkle the blood before the veil in the holy place. And my sins were symbolically transferred from me to the lamb, from the lamb to the sanctuary. And there my sins remained in the sanctuary for a period of time. So who participated in this typical service? Did the Ammonites, the Egyptians, the Canaanites? It was the Israelites. So the professed people of God participated in the service for the sin offering, correct? Whose sins were then transferred to the sanctuary? The Israelites' sins. So then who participated in the Day of Atonement for the ancient Israelites? The one day a year. The people who had their sins forgiven and transferred to the sanctuary. God's people. And why am I bringing this up? Because the Day of Atonement here in the end, the investigative judgment in the end, is for God's people. It's for those who profess to be the people of God. Let's turn to Leviticus 16. This is where we hit the Day of Atonement. Leviticus 16. I'm not going to read um, all of Leviticus 16. I expect you all to read that in your free time. But I'm going to start reading um, in uh, verse 6. Because then you have something called the Day of Atonement. It happens on the 10th day of the 7th month, once a year. And this is where the sins were symbolically removed from the sanctuary. The sanctuary was cleansed, and the sins went somewhere else. So it happened in verse uh, Leviticus 16.6, 6, Aaron shall offer a bull as a sin offering for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself in his house. Then he shall take two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. So you had, there's actually four animals involved here, but I'm going to just touch three of them. You had a bull, and that was for atonement of the priest and his family. The priest had to be cleansed first before he could cleanse the sanctuary and cleanse Israel in general. Then you had two goats were selected. Okay, so let's go back to Leviticus 16.8. It talks about the two other goats that were involved in the Day of Atonement. So lot, lots are cast for these two goats, and one is for the Lord, and one goat is for Azazel. Now, if you're reading King James, New King James, or NIV, it is the scapegoat. And Aaron shall present the goat, so I'm reading verse 9, he shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord, and use it for a sin offering. But the goat which the lot fell on for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it, that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. So we have two goats here. One is for Yahweh, one is for Azazel. Now why am I saying Azazel? Uh, King James Version calls it the scapegoat. Other versions, trans, they, they translate the word in the same Hebrew term that it is originally written, Azazel. Azazel means several things. It means the goat that goes away, a.k.a. scapegoat. Okay, But it's really a proper name, the way it's written there. Okay, You have a goat for Yahweh and a goat for another entity. And this name, Azazel, is only found here in Leviticus. Nowhere else. Nowhere else in the Bible. So if Yahweh is a proper name, or the Lord, this other name should be a proper name because of Hebrew parallelism. So what is going on here? Well, if you look in some of the extra-biblical literature, Azazel is the name of a demon found in the literature of the Dead Sea Scrolls and in other ancient uh, Jewish literature. And he was believed to be the leader of the fallen angels that sinned. And he was also believed to reside in the abyss or the pit out in the desert. 
So the name Azazel is tied to wilderness, desert, the goat that goes away to the desert, the goat that goes to the demon who rules in the desert. Because the desert was considered a place that was uninhabited, dangerous, chaos. It was not a place where you found God. It was a place where you found the devil. So the whole idea here is that you have the holy ground of the people of God, and, then you, and they are traveling through unholy ground, demonic territory, which is ruled by another being. Now there's a little bit of controversy on Azazel and how it's, trans, how it's translated in this Bible. Okay? But I think the Adventist message really would fall in line with Azazel being a demonic entity. Because as time goes on, uh, and into the Jewish people of that time, Azazel really was a form of Satan, another name for Satan. And that ties in a lot with our theology as a reformer. So the whole idea was, we'll go to Leviticus 16, 15. Then he shall kill the goat. And I, I'll, I'll put in brackets here, Yahweh's goat, the goat for Yahweh. Uh, so he shall kill the goat of Yahweh for the offering that is for the people. And he will bring the blood inside the veil. So here the priest is now leaving the holy place and crossing into the most holy place. This was a very solemn ceremony. Into the most holy place. And what is in the most holy place? That's the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. And he will sprinkle the blood of the goat that was for Yahweh on the mercy seat where the holy Shekinah glory was, was sitting. And the priest shall make an atonement for the holy place and the tent of meeting. And eventually, he, he atones several things. He starts in the holy place, and he works his way out. In the end, he even atones for the altar. And when all of this is completed, if we go to Leviticus 16, 21 and 22, the priest comes, and he goes, and he lays his hands on the head of the living goat, the goat for Azazel. And he confesses all the iniquities of the people of Israel, all their transgressions and all their sins. And he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. And the goat shall bear their iniquities on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. So brothers and sisters, this goes a lot a lot with our theology. This goat goes off to Satan's land. The sins that were symbolically in the sanctuary, where do they go? They go off of holy ground to unholy ground, back to the originator of sins. In fact, if you look at Leviticus 16.22 uh, in the SDA Bible Commentary, they say that the Israelites knew that they had sinned and come short of God's expectation for them. But throughout this Day of Atonement, they had a visual demonstration of their complete separation from the sins they had confessed and been forgiven during the year that had now ended, and of God's goodness in sparing their lives. They knew that they, had, they did not deserve the grace extended to them, but by the shed blood of the Atonement Day sacrifice, the very record of their forgiveness, forgiven sins had been blotted out from the sanctuary." Now as they watched the scapegoat depart, they witnessed the last act of the drama. Satan, with all the sins he had instigated, were returned upon his own head, going off to his own doom. So why do I bring this up? Why is the Day of Atonement so important? Hebrews 8, all of Hebrews really answers this, but in Hebrews 8, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now the point of what we are saying is this, that we have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. We'll just jump to verses 5 and 6. They... Brackets, these are the earthly sacrifices and the priests on this earth at the time of Israel. They serve as a copy 
and a shadow of the heavenly things. Verse 6. But as it, as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that has a much that is much more excellent than the old. So what was the Day of Atonement for the Israelites? It was a shadow of heavenly things. It was a shadow of something that was to happen in the heavenly sanctuary. So why do we go through this in detail? Because if you go to Daniel 8.14, this is what we can do in another time. Daniel 8.14, King James Version. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So there is a time in earth's history. Remember our brother from Ukraine, he went over the times, like the days of creation, how they could be periods, and there is a time for judgment. That was last, last November, October, November. There is a time where the sanctuary in heaven, the one, the anti-type, type meets anti-type, when it will be cleansed. That is the Day of Atonement. And hence we get this idea of 1844 being the start of judgment for the people of God. Of this Ellen White in the Great Controversy, page 45, she says, All who have ever taken upon themselves the name of Christ must pass the searching scrutiny. Both the living and the dead are to be judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. Those who profess to be the people of God are going to be the ones who are judged. It was only the Israelites. So where does that leave you and me, since we profess to be the people of God? You know, it's generally believed that, it's generally believed that the, that the uh, Day of Atonement or the investigative judgment begins with, with God's people, and it starts... From the beginning, those who have passed away. And then the question is, when will it reach those who are alive today? When will you or I be pulled up before the bar of God? We don't really know. But First, uh, first Peter 4.17 is very clear that judgment must begin where? At the house of God. If it first begins at us, what then shall be the end of those who do not obey the gospel? I could, I could read this whole chapter to you. It's that good. And it's also very long. I try to cut down on my quotes, but it's hard. The work of the investigative judgment and the blotting out of sins is to be accomplished before the second advent of the Lord. Since the dead are to be judged out of the, written, out of the things written in the book, it is impossible that the sins of men should be blotted out until after the judgment at which their cases are to be investigated. When the judgment, when the investigative judgment closes, Christ will come and reward, and his reward with him, to give every man according to what his work shall be. In the typical service, the high priest, may, having made the atonement for Israel, came forth and blessed the congregation. So Christ, at the close of his work as mediator, will appear and bless the people who are waiting with eternal life. As the priest is removing the sins from the sanctuary, confessed upon them, and putting them on the scapegoat, so Christ will place all these sins upon Satan, Azazel, the goat for Azazel, who is the originator and instigator of the skins. The scapegoat bearing the sins of Israel was sent away to a land not inhabited, so Satan bearing the guilt of all the sins which he has caused God's people to commit will be bound for a thousand years on the earth, which will be desolate and without inhabitation. And he will be the last to suffer the penalty of sin. You know, this is found, we get this in our church, Revelation 20, I believe, where Satan is bound and thrown in the pit for a thousand years. So the melding between Azazel and the eschatological end of the devil is really beautiful how he is taken away. So I would like to, to focus on here, where are our sins right now? Where are our sins? 
You know, as, as Christians, we like, to, we like to make a very cheap, a very cheap grace, right? Jesus came, he washed my sins away, I'm good. Where are your sins? Are they washed in the depths of the sea? Are they gone? Is that filth gone? If you've been judged, that filth is somewhere. But if you have not been judged, where is your filth? It's in the heavenly sanctuary. It is in the heavenly sanctuary. It has been, had the blood covering them, but the sins are still there. And you know, these sins, they are never gone. Even with the blood of Christ, they have to go somewhere. There has to be a purging and a removal. They have to go somewhere, and eventually, in the end, they go back on the instigator of sin. How solemn the thought, day after day, passing into eternity, bears its burden of records for the books of heaven. Words once spoken, deeds once done, must never be, can never be recalled. Angels have registered both good and evil. The mightiest conqueror upon earth cannot call back the record of even a single day. Our acts, our words, even our most secret motives have their weight in deciding our destiny for weal or woe. Though they may be forgotten by us, they will bear testimony to justify or to condemn. May God help us. If you read... If you read in Leviticus 16, what did the people of Israel do on the Day of Atonement? They afflicted themselves. They were praying. They were fasting. It was a Sabbath for them. How are we living our lives in the final Day of Atonement? Are we afflicting our souls? Are we searching our souls? Page 488, Greek Controversy. The intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death on the cross. You know, we focus on the death, we focus on the resurrection, but that's missing 50% of the plan of redemption. The divine intercessor presents his plea that all who overcome through faith in his blood be forgiven their transgressions, that they be restored to their Eden home crowned as joint heirs with himself to the first dominion. Satan, in his efforts to deceive and tempt our race, had thought to frustrate the divine plan in man's creation. But Christ now asks that this plan be carried into effect, as if man had never fallen. He asks for his people, not only pardon and justification, be full and complete, but a share in his glory and a seat upon his throne. So this isn't just a restitution, where your sins are washed away and you're a clean slate. This is a glorification to sit with him on his throne. Now here's what I brought up last, sat, uh, last time. You know, we like to say that Satan has been tethered, he's been cast down after the death of Christ, and he, he probably has. He's no longer allowed to go tempt all the worlds. But the way Ellen White writes this in her writings... Satan is there. The accuser is there. You kind of have a reenactment, either in her picture that she paints, or in reality, I know not, but it doesn't really matter. You have a reenactment of Zechariah 3. While Jesus is pleading for the subjects of his grace, Satan accuses them before God and his transgressors. The great deceiver sought to lead them into the skepticism to cause them to lose confidence in God, to separate themselves from his love. Now the devil points to the record of their lives, to the defects of their character, the unlikeness of Christ, which has dishonored their Redeemer, to all the sins that he has tempted them to commit. And because of these claims, he calls them his subjects. But Jesus does not excuse their sins. He shows their penitence and faith and claims for them forgiveness. He lifts up his wounded hands before the Father and the holy angels saying, I know them by name. I have graven them on the palms of my hands. The sacrifice of God or a broken and contrite spirit. O oh God, thou wilt not despise. And to the accuser of his people, he declares, the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? 
all need to have a knowledge for themselves of the position and work of their great high priest. Otherwise, it will be impossible for them to exercise the faith which is essential to the plan of salvation, which is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death on the cross. We must by faith enter within the veil whither our forerunner has entered. The salvation of man is accomplished at infinite expense to God. The sacrifice made is equal to the broadest demands of the broken law. Aren't these beautiful quotes? Let's go one more time. Let's go one more time through our sins. The sinner went. We go, we sin, we offer our sins up to Christ. We say, you know what, Christ, I am a sinner. Forgive me. I want to change my way, change my life. We accept the blood of Christ upon our sins. Our sins go to the heavenly sanctuary. There they are stored in the heavenly sanctuary until the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement, we believe, began in 1844, and it is progressing from the people of God, and eventually one day you're in my life, will come up to the bar of God. Where will our sins go from that point? Does my membership as an Adventist save me? Would a Jew who is circumcised be saved? Would a Jew who offered all the burnt offerings all throughout the year be saved if he had not afflicted his soul? It says in Leviticus they would be cut off. See, here's where cheap grace doesn't work because the sins are still there. Either my sins will go onto the head of Azazel, either I'll accept the sacrifice, the goat for God, Christ, the representative of Christ, be killed, and his sins, he bears a sin to cleanse the sanctuary, and that sanctuary sin then goes onto the, onto the devil. So either the devil bears my sins away for all of eternity, or I have to bear my sins. And then I, the judgment's over then we're cut off. Great Controversy, page 49. We are now living in that great day of atonement. The typical service while the high priest was making atonement for Israel, all were required to afflict their souls by repentance of sin and humiliation before the Lord, lest they be cut off from among the people. In like manner, all who would have their names retained in the book of life should now, in the few remaining days of their probation, afflict their souls before God. By sorrow for sin and true repentance, there must be a deep, faithful searching of the heart. A light, frivolous spirit indulged by so many professed Christians must be put away. There is earnest warfare before all who would subdue evil tendencies that strive for the mastery. This is very interesting. The work for preparation is an individual work. The, the circumcised Jew didn't get in because he was circumcised or because he was a Jew. Or because he even had, he could have had burnt offerings 365 days a year. But if he had not afflicted his soul, it's over. The work of preparation is an individual work. We are not saved in groups. The purity and devotion of one will not offset the want of these qualities in another. Though all nations are to pass in judgment before God, yet he will examine the case of each individual with as close and searching scrutiny as if there were not another human being upon the earth. Everyone must be tested and found without a spot or wrinkle or any such thing. When the work of the investigated judgment closes, the destiny of all will have been decided for life or death. Probation is ended a short time before the appearing of the Lord in the clouds of heaven. You know, we're all waiting for the Lord to come. We're all waiting for the Lord to come. And this world is such a terrible place. It's true. 
But this is all time, and hopefully the signs of the times can let us realize that this world is just a, a passing vapor, and we should be thankful for the time we have to afflict our souls before our probation is over. Because as soon as the probation is closes, as is closed, as is, as is said in Revelation 22.11, what does it say there? He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Then, then it's over. Then Christ will come. All who have received the light upon these subjects are to bear testimony of the great truths which God has committed to them. The sanctuary in heaven is the very center of Christ's work in the behalf of men. You know, we get so lost in the cross, and it's great. But we need to go back to the sanctuary. What does she say here? It is the very center of Christ's work in the behalf of men. You know, Christ spent, what, 30 years, 33 years, and not all of that was in ministry, right? That was a very small portion of his life was spent here on earth. How much was spent as a priest? Because you think when Christ died, he resurrected, he went to heaven, and what was he doing? He was ministering in the holy place as a priest, right? And then what happens? The day of atonement comes, and now he is ministering the, what only a high priest could do. All the other priests could do other things, but now he is the ultimate priest. This is, this is thousands of years that he's been working in a priestly function, and now hundreds of years that he's been working on the day of atonement. Way more than just a few years of his practice here on earth, and, if, and, and his, his sacrifice, which was infinite. But we fail to realize the very center being the sanctuary. It concerns every soul living upon this earth. It opens up the view of the plan of redemption, bringing us down to the very close of time and revealing the triumphant issue of the contest between righteousness and sin. In conclusion, I'd like to read one last quote for us all. All need a knowledge for themselves of the position and work for their great high priest. Otherwise, it will be impossible for them to exercise the faith which is essential at this time or to occupy the position which God designs them to fill. Every individual has a soul to save or to lose. Each has a case pending at the bar of God. Each must meet that great judge face to face. So in conclusion, we see judgment in the marriage feast, judgment in the case of Zechariah. The choice is, is up to us. Zechariah, uh, in, in Zechariah you have Joshua the high priest, he was afflic afflicting his soul. He was playing that priest, going into the most holy place with his feces stained garments, but what did he accept? Purification and a change of raiment. As we are living now here in the end times, in the day of atonement, I ask that we may remember our sins, remember the gift. Ellen White says it was an infinite cost, and it continues to be an infinite cost, that heaven has paid for our souls. And may we realize that we have our souls and those that we love around us to gain or to lose, and that we soon, if may not already be, at the bar, judgment bar of God. Amen.